to your 
that. <laughs> Good afternoon. Okay, seriously, y'all gonna make me work for it? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'll, I'll take it. Um, uh, it's good to be here with you all. I'm thrilled to see that we have uh, such a great turnout for this conversation. Uh, and, you know, I, I'll start by, oh, I should introduce myself. My name is Jelani Cobb. Uh, I'm the Dean of Columbia Journalism School. Uh, I'm still, I'm most of the way used to saying that, you know. Um, still getting used to it a little bit, but uh, I have been here for six weeks, have it all figured out. Um, so this is the first uh, program of our academic year. Uh, this is the first program, uh, public program of my deanship. Uh, that is not a coincidence. Those things are not coincidental. Uh, I, in the conversation that uh, I had with Kyle Pope, who is the moderator for this conversation and the editor of Columbia Journalism Review, uh, one of the first things that came up was that we really needed to tackle this conversation about objectivity. Uh, it wasn't difficult for me to come to that conclusion uh, because students at the J School have brought this up to me. Uh, faculty have brought this up to me. People on the street have stopped me and said, what do you think about objectivity? Like, you know, where is this going? Like, should we, should we still be thinking about objectivity? And so uh, after a minute, it, it occurred to me that we should have this conversation. Uh, we are a journalism school uh, at a prestigious university. Uh, we uh, operate in some ways uh, like a news organization, in some ways like an academic uh, institution, uh, because we are both of those things. And one of the benefits of that is that being familiar with how news operates, uh, we know how to write on deadline, we know how to frame a story and those sorts of things. But we have the luxury that is uh, often not afforded to people who are working intensely in media, we have the luxury of sometimes stepping back uh, and taking a broader view of a conversation. And so that's what we want to do today. Uh, we have a very esteemed uh, group of panelists, uh, one, of, one of whom, uh, Wesley Lowry, is still en route. Uh, so he will be joining the conversation in progress. Um, but starting uh, from my left, from my left uh, we have uh, Masha Gessen, uh, who in addition, I can't, I can't list all your books. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I said, uh, the last time I saw you was around the time that one of your books had come out. That's not unusual, because it happens like uh, every month or so uh, with you. Uh, but is you know, my uh, colleague, also uh, my colleague at The New Yorker. Uh, and next to Masha, we have uh, Lewis Raven Wallace, uh, who is the author uh, of, no. oops, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, next to uh, Masha, we have uh, Andy Tucker, who is my colleague at the Journalism School and uh, the author of Not Exactly Fake News, uh, and, you know, which is a really thoughtful examination of this question, uh, and in addition to being the director of our PhD program and does you know, all sorts of wonderful things, uh, when we were thinking about this conversation, we, like uh, the first person I thought of was that uh, we need to talk to Andy, we need to have her uh, in this dialogue, so we're happy that uh, Andy is here with us as well. Next to Andy, uh, we have uh, Lewis Raven Wallace uh, and Wesley Lowry, who is uh, interested in making a grand entrance, <laughs> <laughs> is making his way down the center aisle, uh, ladies and gentlemen. The man in legend is here with us. Um, but as I was saying, um, Wesley and I have this kind of ongoing thing where we rib each other all the time, so it's, so bear that in mind. Uh, Lewis's book was, is very provocative and thought-provoking. Uh, I have uh, used it in uh, 
the view from somewhere, I'm sorry I should have mentioned the title. Uh, I've used it in my classes and uh, really, again, as we were having this conversation, we were thinking of names uh, of people that needed to be included and uh, it didn't take long to, to think that Lewis needed to be con part of this conversation as well. Uh, next to Lewis, uh, we have, well, going back in the other direction, uh, we have Wesley Lowry, and uh, you know Wesley is uh, very many things in addition to uh, his work as a journalist, uh, but he is also a two-time uh, Pulitzer Prize winner, uh, and a person whose work, just personally speaking, uh, was so deeply uh, informative and so uh, well done in the crucible of a difficult moment. We met in Ferguson. Uh, and uh, has just continued to meet that bar consistently since then. Uh, and most notably has weighed in on this subject uh, in a New York Times op-ed, uh, which got a lot of conversations started since then. And so uh, that was why we reached out to Wesley to, be put, to participate in this as well. And uh, here we have David Greenberg, who is, uh, everyone here I'm, I have the fortune of knowing or at least uh, attempting to quote. Uh, and we were colleagues. I uh, spoke to David about a piece I was working on for The New Yorker about how political parties die. Uh, and we were uh, briefly colleagues at Rutgers University uh, and uh, have uh, you know, had many uh, kind of interaction on journalism listservs and so on. Uh, and uh, you may have read his essay on objectivity in the journal Liberties, uh, which came out, uh, when did that come out? Spring. Yeah, in the spring. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and you know, gained a lot of traction and a lot of attention, uh, and uh, really has been a formative part of this conversation as well. Uh, and then, of course, we have Kyle Pope, who will be moderating. Uh, I'm going to wrap up here, but I will say um, that we have the the good fortune of having the space, uh, of having the people, and having the time to have this conversation. And I uh, really think. Uh, that this is uh, what we do at Columbia Journalism School. Uh, this is what we do at the Columbia Journalism Review. Uh, and uh, this is how we help to shape the conversation about where we are going uh, as a society and as uh, a institution and as a journalist. So thank you. I'm going to turn it over to Kyle now. And we look forward to the conversation. Everybody hear me okay? Um, welcome, Wesley. I, I feel like Wesley got, um, got the, raw into the stick. He was actually late because we screwed up some of the travel arrangements, so it's on us. But welcome. Good to see you. Um, I'm so happy to be here. It's been two and a half years since, since, since the JR has been able to sort of convene a conversation like this. And our convening power is one of the things that I love about CJR and its place in the journalism world, so welcome. We're really happy to be here. Um, you know, this conversation, uh, just, to, uh, just to add just a tiny bit to what Jelani said, is really about how can and should journalism change in response to a, a world that's changing in, in sometimes terrifying ways. And how do we think about that how do we respond to it? Um, we are lucky, I think, to work in an industry where the rules and the norms aren't dictated to us from the outside. We don't have a regulatory body telling us what to do. We don't have a standards body that says this is the way journalism has to be practiced. It evolves over time. And um, it evolves with us um, and with you. And so what we're here to do today is, to, is one, to acknowledge I think, and I think we all will agree on this, that it has to change and it has to evolve in the way that it's been practiced needs to change. So the question really is about what does that look like and what does that mean and how do we sort of embrace that? Um, we're gonna have this conversation uh, for about 45 minutes or so and then we're gonna leave a big chunk of time, about half an hour, for your questions. Um, We'll ask that you line up behind that microphone. We're being live streamed here to um, hundreds of people on YouTube. So make sure you stand in front of the mic so they can hear you. 
and please um, form your question in the form of a question. <laughs> um, let me start with David. Um, Jelani mentioned this piece that you wrote in Liberties um, on objectivity in which you raise concerns and questions about some of these, some of the debate that we're having. Um, before, and, 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 you, and you reference some of the people on the panel. Um, before we get into that part of the discussion, I think it would be helpful for, for us to frame this in terms of the history of how this principle even came into effect. Um, how do we trace journalistic objectivity? What, it, what are its roots? Why, why was it introduced? Right. Sure, thanks. And um, is, is my mic working? Is that working? Good. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a historian, so I guess it, it falls to me to do this a little bit, although Andy, of course, has written on this, and uh, your colleague, uh, Michael Shudson, has really written what I still think is the definitive book on uh, the emergence of objectivity in journalism, uh, discovering the news, which is several decades old now, so it you know it uh, it stops kind of after the '60s, but it's still a really great and very accessible uh, account. Um, you know, it, it sometimes comes as a surprise to people to know that this notion of uh, objective journalism in the newspapers, uh, in the reported columns. Uh, as opposed to, say, in the op-ed pages, uh, wasn't always the model in American journalism. And for much of the 19th century, you had an overtly partisan press, much like Fox and MSNBC uh, make no secret of which party or which side they are uh, aligned with in their general kind of uh, 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 presentation of, of the news. You know, we, we part, a lot of newspapers originated actually literally as the organs of political parties. They were paid for and run by the parties. Um, some of them had names like, you know, the Springfield Republican or the St. Louis Democrat. You could, you could tell where their politics were. And in the late 19th century, you began to see sort of the emergence of professionalization in a lot of fields, in law, in medicine. Uh, in the social sciences in particular, and the, I, the emergence of, of uh, positivism, of uh, a kind of factually oriented uh, approach to gathering and then distilling and analyzing information, which kind of made its way into journalism as well. Sometimes a watershed moment uh, is pointed to in the 1890s when Adolph Oakes bought the New York Times and said, it would now deliver the news without fear or favor. And the Times really did make an effort uh, to uh, be both uh, objective in its news pages, uh, but also on the editorial page not to be uh, you know, clearly aligned with one political party or the other. The thing when we talk about objectivity and you know, should it remain, should it uh, continue to uh, be our model for journalism, we sometimes forget that with this emergence of objectivity in the newspapers and in organizations like the Wire Services, the Associated Press, whose history actually precedes that of the, the New York Times, um, Reuters, and so on, these places we go to, to get the news uninflected, we've always had, alongside it, a very robust sphere of advocacy journalism, of opinion journalism, of partisan journalism, of polemics, of provocations, of fake news, of all kinds of news. You, you know, we, the, the nation goes back 125 years. The Atlantic goes back to the 19th century. We've had right-wing papers, uh, left-wing papers. So I think when we ask the question today, well, should this model of objective journalism remain, um, we're not, you know, it, it, it's a bit misleading because we already have many other models where people who want to practice a different form of journalism can go and thrive and succeed and find followers and win arguments and, and make a difference. And I think the strength of the American system over the last hundred years has come from the fact we've actually had, had both of those models in play. Now in the 1960s, I think, uh, you began to see a particular critique 
of the model at newspapers like the New York Times. Um, it wasn't entirely new. I mean, you can find in my Liberties piece, I quote, you know, Archibald McLeish in the 1940s who criticized reporters for thinking they were being objective when they were simply kind of citing one side and then citing the other. We call that both sidesism. That's one pitfall of this form of journalism. But there's another pitfall, of course, which is going in the opposite direction and veering into editorializing, bias. I mean, objectivity, in a way, is the attempt to identify our own biases and correct for them so they don't inflect the, the uh, conveyance of the news. So I think the current debate we're having really, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up, I, we, have, we have five people to start with, I'll, I can say more on this later, but I think the 1960s were really kind of the fulcrum point when a lot of these ideas came under pressure. And in some ways, I think news institutions in the in intervening 50 years really did try to address them, in some ways successfully, in some ways not so successfully. And in recent years, I think we've had a resurgence of a lot of these questions that are really rooted uh, in those debates uh, from the 1960s. I think we've, we've managed to have objectivity kind of bend without breaking in, in the intervening years, and I think we can do so again. Lewis, um, you wrote a piece called Objectivity is Dead and I'm Okay with It uh, for Medium. Um, and for writing that, you were fired um, from your job in public radio. Um, so I, I, I assume that you don't view this as, uh, as quite as benign as David? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll talk a little bit about and sort of practice what I preach in terms of subjectivity about how I came in to this. Uh, I came into journalism from a history of activism and I came into activism because I came out as trans when I was a teenager, uh, as queer and trans and that was in the late 90s and so I was uh, existing and working in a context where to be myself meant to advocate, in a sense, uh, to, to create a world where I could uh, live, work, be a journalist, meant putting forth in some ways a new version of reality and saying, this is who I am, this is my subjective truth, and I want it to be part of the conversation. And so that and the community that formed around that was um, central to the reasons that I became a journalist. For me, it was all about uh, telling the stories of my life and my existence, the people I was in community with, young people, queer and trans people, people of color who weren't being represented in mainstream news outlets uh, or were being misrepresented and that's another reality I think of trans existence has been a lot of misrepresentation, not just underrepresentation. And so the facade of objectivity was actively used to silence and exclude us. I became a journalist and it was like, here's the rules, you gotta follow them if you're gonna work in public radio, okay. I did that for about five years and then when Donald Trump was elected, there was this increased anxiety about this question in newsrooms and I was working in a national newsroom covering the economy and they're real day-to-day -day questions like, okay, if we're gonna run two stories today about something that Trump lied about, do we need to do a third story about something that he did, you know, that was good? Um, <laughs> that kind of stuff, right? And I'm not making that up, that's a real example. Um, another example was, um, you know, can we say that he's racist? Um, can we say that he, uh, in the case of the blog post that I wrote, benefits from white supremacy? Um, which I think is a, like a checkable fact, um, but others saw as a partisan sort of depiction of who Trump is. And so when I wrote that blog post, it was a blog post that had like, you know, 12 followers and like 36 people read it. Um, <laughs> it was on my personal blog. And I was like, I don't know guys, what do you think? Um, objectivity seems like it might not be the right frame for dealing with this uh, sort of tyrannical lying person um, who also specifically has it out for 
Muslims, black people, and trans people. And that had real consequences in terms of our lived experiences and violence and real consequences in terms of the work of being a journalist. So my kind of invitation was to other journalists to look to the traditions that already exist of fighting journalism uh, in the US and around the world that are historical and today, learn from that and figure out, you know, what are we gonna, where are we gonna stand on the Trump administration, on racism and white supremacy, on racial capitalism, on climate change, and not as a sort of permanent engraving of our stance, but in order to make these difficult, uh, I think, very subjective moral decisions about what we will cover, how we will cover it, how we'll treat the people whose stories we're telling, uh, what we believe is an important story and what should be included. And so my argument is not against uh, meticulous or rigorous processes of fact checking. It's against the dangerous mythology that it's possible to rest on a sort of fundamentally objective viewpoint or even that it's the right aspiration to try to achieve because the way that that aspiration has been deployed has been to exclude and silence. Um, and I don't think we need it. I think we're in a different moment in terms of the economy of journalism, the access that we all have to platforms. There's been this kind of breaking open and exciting possibility in this moment um, where we're hearing from more and more communities that have not had access to those platforms before. And so some of the rancor and all the fighting and everybody's angry, I think that's actually because we're hearing from more people who were angry 50 years ago or who were angry, in my case, 20 years ago and didn't have a platform. And so there's a way to kind of reframe and think about some of these debates over uh, over fairness, debates over accuracy, debates over even partisanship as a positive thing that we should be having. And objectivity to me has been uh, kind of a silencing force. And that obviously in my life it was a silencing force, literally. You know, it's, I was no longer in a national newsroom and went and wrote this book and did other things. And that's been true for a lot of other people. Um, but that's sort of. Uh, more like a byproduct of what I see as a foundational problem with the framework. And I'm going to stop so that Wesley can talk. Um, Wesley, you in your op-ed that Jelani referenced um, made a similar point about this notion that the, the objective truth in these newsrooms, uh, you said, um, the mainstream has allowed what it considers objective truth to be cited almost exclusively by white reporters and they're mostly white bosses. Um, and those selective truths have been calibrated to avoid offending their sensibilities. Um, can you talk a little bit about, well, one, about this conversation specifically as it relates to the coverage of, of race and, of the, and how that's reflected by the demographic makeup of big newsrooms? Um, let's start with that, and then I have a follow-up question. Well, sure. I'm happy to and happy to be here. Um, I, I think that as we think about that, now that sentence in the op-ed is an objective fact, right? That's not debatable. We know that this is an industry that until very recently had completely excluded people of color from its leadership. If Joseph Pulitzer came back today, he'd be very confused by the people on this panel, much less that Jelani Cobb is the dean of his school. <laughs> <laughs> um, and <laughs> <laughs> the um, when ASNE and Sigma Chi Delta, which is the predecessor to SBJ, first put the ideas of impartiality and objectivity into their standards in the 1920s, we are aware of who was in that room and who was not, who was involved in those conversations and who was not. Um, we know who owns and operates our news organizations and who does not. Um, and, and so we know for a fact uh, that, that, that what I wrote there is true. Uh, my friend Adam Soar talks about, we, him and I talk about this uh, privately, I assume he said this publicly, that a lot of what we see playing out is the continued backlash to integration. When we talk about newsrooms and the quote unquote clashes inside of them, right? the vast majority of American newsrooms were explicitly racially segregated until the 1970s. Um, the, did most of them did not take 
real efforts to begin desegregating until the 80s and early 90s, at which point there was a massive backlash from the white people who worked in the newsrooms. Uh, and then we hit the economic downturns that then purged most of the people of color who'd gotten into the newsrooms in the first place. Uh, we, so when we talk about dynamics that are happening within our newsrooms, we have to understand that these are still essentially apartheid institutions. Right, these are all white institutions with a sprinkling of other people who've managed to make their way in over time. That is not to say these institutions are not and have not invested and made real efforts. It's not to say that they're not trailblazing and hardworking journalists of color, but the exception is the thing that proves the rule, right? Uh, in, uh, we know that there are almost no mainstream news organizations that reflect the diversity of the, of the places they ostensibly cover, much less of the nation that they ostensibly cover. And we know the higher up you go, the less true that's, that is. And, and it is, I think, worth noting that that is especially true on issues of race. It is true on issues of gender, certainly. Um, and it is and it's also especially true on issues of, uh, of sexuality and gender identity. Uh, but on issues of race, uh, which often gets coupled into gender, it's far more true. We, we know this. Um, the, um, the numbers bear it out, and, and so much so that now the news organizations refuse to even provide the numbers because they don't want to be embarrassed by it. Um, and so what we know is that the act of journalism, no matter how much we may fetishize the idea of objectivity, uh, requires a series, a pyramid of subjective decision making. You have to decide that a story is a story in the first place. You have to decide how much resource to devote to that story. You have to decide if that story goes on the front page or on the, or on the back page. You have to decide which people to call in interview and then which things that those people said make it into the story and in which order they make it in. We understand that there's a, there are, I, many of my friends and colleagues are in this room. There's, there are probably a hundred top flight journalists in this room. We all were writing up this panel discussion. It would read differently. Right? That is the inherent subjectivity of journalism. My piece will be different than your piece because we will make different subjective decisions. Um, what we, and so, the reason we have to talk about the lack of diversity, mainstream journalism's bitter refusal to integrate, is because when these subjective decisions are being made on issues of race, on issues of law enforcement, on issues of how much deference we provide to law enforcement or government officials, uh, who is in the room and who is making those decisions and what are their politics, what are their backgrounds, what are their biases, right? Um, the example, and I cite this example in that piece, but it's one of the examples where I think things boiled over in the country, was when the former president described four congresswomen of color um, as, as foreigners who should go back to the, quote, crime-infested countries where they came from, end quote. Um, and this, by all objective fact, is a nativist attack. Nativism is a form of racism. It was racist. The thing he did was racist. Uh, there's no, uh, that's just what the definition of the word is. Um, and yet, most of our news organizations refused to describe it as such. They made up terms that don't have any uh, racially charged, as if he had plugged into a charger of racism. <laughs> um, or of race, not even racistly charged, race, ra ra whatever that means. Truly whatever that means. I don't know what that means. Um, the, and, and here we are, the, the bulwarks of our democracy, the fourth estate, too scared to, to look at the sky and say that it's blue. Now, what I would suggest, now again, that's a subjective decision, right? I, while I think it is true clearly that in that specific case, the, the overwhelming weight of the evidence uh, of the available reporting was that this was a racist attack on these congresswomen, understanding that to describe something that way, different people of good faith and of rigor could come to different conclusions. So each news organization in our country was tasked with deciding, had this met the bar? Who was in those rooms in each of those news organizations? What I, might have, what I might suggest is that if those news organizations, which we know at the very best had one, maybe two faces of color in those rooms, what if it had been flipped? What if it was a newsroom where of the 10 decision makers, eight of them were people of color and two of them are white? I would suggest it'd be very, it, it's unquestionable that our news organizations would have felt comfortable declaring it racist, right? And so again, what that underscores is the inherent subjectivity of the work we're doing and how that subjectivity, how those decisions are limited by who we are allowing to make decisions and who those people believe they are serving and servicing. And there's been no point in the history of American journalism where those decisions and those standards have not been decided almost exclusively by 
upper class white men. Okay, let me let me move on to Andy. Um, you wrote this book about um, fake news and fake journalism, which is a term I want to ask you about. Um, one of the things you 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 say is that this whole the, even the term objectivity has become almost lost real meaning in the sense that we don't all mean the same thing when when we use it. Um, but you also say, um, and I'd be curious what you think about what um, Lewis and Wesley said, because they basically say, given the makeup of newsrooms, you, you can't cover these stories. Of, you know, there, there's, no object, there's no objectively sort of neutral way to do this. Um, but you fear, you wrote um, in, in the last chapter of your book that you really fear um, that if journalism moves away from objectivity, it's going to further open the space for people practicing what they say is journalism but isn't really. So can you talk to us about, one, about this, the term, and maybe we can rename it while we're sitting here, um, and two, sort of what your concern is? Um, thanks, Kyle. Yeah, um, I discovered as I was working on my book about fake news that fake news is intimately entangled with questions about objectivity. Um, David talked about the beginnings of objectivity as an ideal, the late 19th, early 20th centuries. And that was in large part because in the 19th century, journalism was terrible. It was embarrassing. Um, this school, Columbia Journalism School, was, was founded by Joseph Pulitzer in remorse, I think, in despair and remorse over the terrible things that he countenanced when he was uh, competing with Hearst to cover the Spanish-American War in 1898. So in response to this, the, the, the much of the 19th century journalism was not just um, um, politically partisan, it was also invented. Uh, n interviews were routinely invented, and they talked literally about how much fun it was to fake. You could see it in trade journals. I love to fake, it's really fun. Readers like it, they don't care. Um, it didn't mean the nefarious stuff that, that, that it has come to mean now. It didn't necessarily mean making stuff up out of whole cloth. What it meant was you know, tweaking, embellishing, making things more reader friendly. If the woman was, who fascinated a teacher into running away with her was actually um, uh, 23 and, and a washed out blonde, it doesn't hurt to say that she's 16 and an enchanting brunette, that sort of thing. That was, that was a quote. So the response of the responsible newspapers who wanted to get past this was objectivity was in some ways designed to stamp out fake news, to show what newspapers could and should do, to show what a responsible fact-oriented, evidence-based reporting would look like. And yeah, they didn't always get it right. And that's a, that's, a, that's a real blot, that's a real blemish. But it was better than it was before, and it was so much better according to the, con to, the, to the conditions of the times, that other journalists who were not willing to take on the responsibility of acting objectively, accurately, responsibly, pretended they did. They, th this is where, it came th where the term that I call fake journalism came about, that institutions that were partisan or advocates or hacks would use the language of responsible journalism um, in order to steal the credibility of news organizations that were actually doing the good kind of work. So this fake journalism, I think, is, is, has become, um, uh, it, 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 it has followed all throughout. And where we are now is that one reason we need to think about, what's, about what might be um, salvageable about objectivity, why it, why it is important, is that the fake journalists are trying so hard to act as if they are objective. If you look at the web pages of Breitbart, of Project Veritas, of Infowars, of Sinclair Broadcasting, any of those, those Fox News, deeply partisan, often crazy, often conspiratorial news organizations, they're the ones who say we are doing objective work. We're doing accurate work. We are, we are um, impartial. Truth is our banner. If you look at that and you compare it to the responsible in, 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 and 
careful news organizations that are really trying to work their way through how to deal with this, this, this strange and difficult value of objectivity. They're not talking like that. They're talking about transparency. They're talking about possible activism. They're talking about um, uh, wearing their transparency openly. Where we are ending up, I fear, is that we have two dominant models of, of journalism. We have the right-wing media empire that says, we are the ones who have the facts. And we have the responsible journalists saying, we're working on it. We have the right-wing media empire saying that we are, th that, that you, have, you are just opinion, we have the facts. And we have the responsible journalists saying, it's our opinion that your facts are wrong. So it's a difficult, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a rigged debate, and it leaves me very nervous to, um, that, that, that there are so much, such different, there's such a yawning gap between how these two, these two models are looking at how they work. Masha, um, you've, to the, to the question of wh how should we, what's a better way to talk about this? Um, you've talked about um, moral clarity as a term that journalists um, should not be afraid of and, and, and should even gravitate to. Um, can you talk a little bit about what you mean by that? And also, we're, we're a after this conversation, we're gonna talk about um, a, former ex a former president and how we should be uh, covering that person. But um, one, of the, one of the reasons I think your views are so valuable on this is because you've spent a lot of time um, thinking about authoritarianism in Russia. You recently did a fantastic piece from Ukraine. And you can, s you can look at where we are in American media with a much broader perspective. So can you talk about first moral clarity and then how we should be viewing the situation we're in now um, from, a, from a little bit further out? Um, well, I should make it clear that I, <coughs> I don't think I oppose moral clarity. Uh, I now it's on. Um, I don't think I propose moral clarity as an alternative to objectivity. I think that moral clarity has been bandied about as a sort of um, bugaboo, um, as, as as something that is supposedly haunting our you know, ideal of objectivity, and it's 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 come up fairly consistently. And Wesley has written about it, and actually that you know there was a sort of dialogue between uh, me and Wesley and. Um, in pieces written about, I guess, a year ago. Um, my argument is simply that if we're going to have an ideal, then moral clarity would be a much better guiding ideal for journalism than objectivity would be. Um, and But I, I actually want to backtrack a little bit and talk uh, sort of what, what I understand objectivity to be, um, because oddly, I don't think we've, uh, we've talked about it quite enough. Uh, and um, I mean, I, I actually became a journalist in the 80s in the, gay press writing about AIDS. Mm -hmm. And that to me, th th that, is, that is a formative experience for me, and it's a formative experience of understanding that journalism is a political act. It was a very clearly political act. You, we, we reported on you know, drug trials, on promising drugs, and people found out about them because they read about it, and if they had, we hadn't reported on it, they wouldn't know about it. Mm -hmm. um, and that, Actually, uh, you, you know, if you if you if you, if you think about it for a minute, it throws this unquestioned assumption of an independently existing reality that we're comfortable with uh, into, into question. You know, that reality is not knowable unless we report on it, and so, uh, and, and and our decisions to report or not report are inherently political, and we're inherently parts of the of the uh, of this reality that uh, uh, that we create which which is funny because you know the ideal of objectivity in journalism flowed in in the 1930s was related to this you know to, to the to this idea that journalists could be more like scientists that that our stories could be more like experiments they could be reproducible and checkable and of course a good scientist is aware of their influence on the results of the experiment and journalists um, stubbornly refuse to to, uh, to see that <coughs> um, to see that real, uh, that that inter interdependence. And one other thing I want to say about my own background is that after I 
worked in the gay press uh, and was an AIDS reporter. I, you know, I was also a native Russian speaker, and then I went to Moscow and tried to get a newsroom job and was told over and over again that one could not transition from advocacy journalism to mainstream journalism. So this idea that advocacy journalism and so-called objective journalism can coexist strikes me as, um, if not false, then maybe facile, because, um, because f f uh, from, the much, uh, from the point of view of the much better resourced so-called objective media, you know, people who have engaged in advocacy journalism are not real journalists. Mm -hmm. right? um, and so, you know, and, and, and habitually objective journalism marginalizes um, advocacy journalism. <coughs> So, um, and then, you know, th I want to talk about, uh, for a minute, more about this sort of, you know, this concept of this independently existing reality that, uh, that journalists are supposedly called, called on to cover. Um, I think it's becoming particularly clear to me now just how egregious this, uh, this position is, uh, the sort of the, the, this, this disavowal of responsibility um, is, and I was I was thinking about it actually when I was reporting the war crime story from Ukraine. Um, I was in Ukraine in early June when the Times published its absolutely staggering investigation into a particular war crime in Bucha, uh, a suburb of Kiev, and <coughs> they were able to get um, to get data, to get uh, you know, to get to to to, uh, to to get video, to analyze it on a scale and with resources that no one on the ground had, right? That uh, that Ukrainian investigators didn't have. That I'm not talking uh, talking about Ukrainian journalists, right? But like the Ukrainian state doesn't have those resources. Mm. The International Criminal Court doesn't have those resources, and the New York Times has those resources, right? So, how can we make an argument for you know an independent observer, an impartial observer, um, when that observer, in many situations around the world, has more resources to document and shape reality than the people on the ground. I think this point that you just made about maybe the notion that we could all be the same stripe is the problem. I think is is very apt I mean, in the sense of like y there's objective newsrooms who call themselves that and there's advocacy journalists who call themselves that and we don't need to call each other the same thing Did I, is that right um no i was actually taking issue with david's point that uh that there's a kind of benevolent coexistence of advocacy okay. and objective journalism okay. i don't see it that way okay but yeah. may i <laughs> well can, can we can we can we um <laughs> Before we get into that, I do want to start talking about how we cover the moment that we're in in this country with an election um, a few months away and how we should be thinking about that because that's the sort of like, that's the issue we all face right now. And by the way, we've all had our chance to talk so the polite part of this can be over now. <laughs> Go ahead, David. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll still be polite. Um, I, I, I don't uh, entirely agree with Masha's Suggestion that this this uh, coexistence is uh, is uh, invidious or or one sided. I think if one looks at the history of news reporters, often the aspiration is do your time as a beat reporter, climb the ladder, and then you get to be a columnist. Then you get to have your opinions and share them and. Uh, uh, you know, have the voice and be an advocate for certain causes. Uh, a lot of New York Times writers find themselves quite happy where mid-career they get to go to the New Yorker and, and open up their voice and, and there's a certain prestige and uh, freedom attached to that position. So uh, yeah, I mean certainly we have powerful institutions like the Times and the Post and the Associated Press where uh, you could say their model is quite um, uh, you know the, the the orthodox or the the baseline against which the advocate the the voice the subjective journalist is measured but from the reader's point of view you know I think most of us avail ourselves of many different forms of these journalism this journalism and are grateful for uh, 
that variety. And the need, I think, to come to your question about the election, you know, one thing I wrote in the, in the Liberties piece, where do we really need that dependable, trustworthy um, bellwether of objectivity? Well, it's when the Associated Press calls the election for Joe Biden. <laughs> then we kind of, all of us, maybe not all of us, but most of us can know, no matter what Trump says, no matter what Breitbart says, there's a certain history and unimpeachable quality to that AP count that a lot of people put stock in. Um, and that, you know, much more than you know, Jeff Zeleny going on CNN, I don't mean to pick on him, but and, and being willing to say, well, Trump's lying when he says he won. Okay, f fine, you, you, can, you can say that. But it's, it's the fact that we know there are institutions devoted to a kind of scrupulously impartial counting of those, you know, votes and then electoral votes uh, that gives us the trust in the, in the political system. So I think without some bedrock of you know, aspirationally objective journalism, and I often phrase it that way because you know, contrary, I think, to some conceptions, objectivity isn't the notion that the individual reporter knows all and has a pipeline to the God's honest truth. It's a method. It's like the scientific method. Uh, and there may be some problems with the comparison with science, but just as scientific trials that were flawed because they only looked at men and not women and therefore you know, came up with wrong results. Doesn't mean you throw out scientific trials or the scientific method. It means you expand the base of people who are included in it. So I think, I think we very much need objectivity in any democracy. How we go about constituting our newsrooms, integrating our newsrooms, uh, understanding the place of diversity, those are all important questions, but they don't fundamentally impeach uh, that singular importance of, of what we call objectivity. I just say, make a very quick com com comment and then and then give it over to Wesley. Um, I mean, it's fascinating that you cite calling the election as the time when we need um, uh, jur uh, objective journalism. It's the one time we actually don't need journalism at all. We actually have people to count the votes. <laughs> we don't need the AP. We need the AP the rest of the time. We need the AP to, the, uh, to report on the candidates, to report on the issues, to call a liar, a liar, uh, a liar, and a racist a racist before the votes need to be counted. Other people can count the votes and tell us what the count is. Beyond that, to cite the calling of Joe Biden as the president as an example of a victory of objectivity is just divorced from reality. We almost had a coup because the country so little respected the, the institutions that called it, right? So to say, well, yeah, it's great that when the AP calls it for Joe Biden, we all know it's true. Well, no, we don't. There was a, there was a white supremacist riot at the Capitol building. <laughs> right? like, clearly a massive failure, right? But, but beyond that, I think we have to be honest about, I, I think we've, we've, frankly, I think we've been a little oversimplistic in our history about objectivity here. We cite beat reporters. Well, beat reporters are actually a creation of more subjective journalism, right? The, cr the idea of a beat reporter is that you have an expertise and therefore can provide a level of analysis that another reporter could not. It was created by the wire services specifically as a diversion from traditional objectivity. And now we've gotten to the point where we're citing that as objectivity, right? And, but it speaks to how this is just kind of this moving and constantly confused concept that means whatever the people in power want it to mean at that given time. What we know is that when we first began using this term, well, and, and I, th I think I'd also add, right, it is very nice to think that the newspapers started behaving this way because they were so aghast by what Pulitzer and Hearst did. They were also very envious of the bottom lines of Pulitzer and Hearst. At the time, the elite newspapers were basically opinion journals, and it was the penny presses that actually did anything like approximating covering the news. And so the shift to professionalized journalism, as well as the shift to a quote unquote objective press, was, was in many ways a mirroring of what Hertz, Hearst and Pulitzer did while attempting to improve on it, right? Uh, we can't pretend as if one of those things is true, but the other is not. Uh, they wanted to make money, and that's why they started doing this, right? The, 
but, but beyond that, we have this conversation about the ideas of objectivity, and, and I'll be honest, I think that in the two years that, we've been, that I've been involved in this conversation, it's been very exhausting because we see a lot of people having a straw man argument with themselves. Um, the, there are very considered, thought out critiques of what has and has not worked, and the response is to argue against something that no one said. Right? I don't believe, I don't believe there's anyone on this stage who thinks we should get rid of rigorous reporting or get rid of fairness or get rid of going through a due process journalistically, right? But I also, I believe that, uh, that Ida Tarbell has a space in the journalism of the moment or Ida B. Wells has a space in the journalism of the moment or I.F. Stone does, right? That the reality is at the same time we saw the rise of the quote unquote object objective journalism, we also had the muckrakers who did, frankly, the most important journalism of that era. And so to, uh, I believe it's important for us to have investigative journalism, to do things like nut graphs, which by the way, are analysis and opinion. They are not straight facts, they are not objective. When I go back and reread the Spotlight investigation, I read a great nut graph that tells me about how horrible this was. Well, that's someone's opinion. Then there's in fact someone who would suggest it is not that horrible. The Catholic Church is on the record saying it's not. Right? But the point of collecting all these facts is to then say what the facts mean. And the tradition of the best journalism has always seen that. And I think that those of us who've critiqued and criticized the status quo have always acknowledged that and always advocated for that, for rigorous journalism that is fair to the people involved. However, what we've been willing to do and willing to look at is how deep the failings of quote unquote ob corporate objective journalism have been for communities that sit outside of the status quo. And everyone else goes, oh, well, sure, they've messed up sometimes. No, 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 they've messed up every single day of its existence. There's not a single day that, in most cities, that the, that the local mainstream newspapers properly, fairly, accurately covered the black community, the immigrant community, its gay community. Not one day. It's a massive failure. And the reason it's failed is because there is not a distinction between the quote unquote subjective journalists and the objective journalists. It's a bunch of people telling themselves they're objective journalists and then writing their opinions into the news. And, and doing so by deciding what stories they cover, what stories they don't cover. All of these subjective measures in the pyramid we talked about before. And if I can just add one more thing, I think that um, you know, calling objectivity a method is misleading. We, don't, we can't define objectivity as a method. Objectivity is a style. Right. And it is a style that, especially in the last, uh, in, since the beginning of the Trump presidency and in, uh, in the aftermath of the Trump presidency, has served to normalize things that ought not be normalized. Right. Because of this, of this habit of putting everything in a, in a sort of shiny, smooth language of objectivity as though it had already been through the machine, it has already been processed, and it has already been accepted as something that should not be marked by excessive passion and excessive opinion. Well, in the, the <laughs> <laughs> I actually had one point I wanted to make and I didn't make it. <laughs> the, um, I think the key to, at least from the criticisms I've loved, has always been about how, again, because I, I don't actually think that when properly defined, very many people disagree with the concept of journalistic objectivity because when properly defined, it's completely anodyne. It doesn't, it's okay, sure, we should call people and ask some questions. Everyone agrees with that. Not everyone, not the right-wing people. We all agree with that. The, but what we've seen from its very beginning, again, to accept the premise that it's this journalistic scientific style, which I agree is open for interpretation and debate and I probably wouldn't agree with, but even if we accept that premise, from its very inception, that is not how it's been used. In the 1920s, newspaper publishers cited quote unquote objectivity as a means to say that any reporter who joined a union could not be trusted and run them out. Objectivity has always been wielded to silence people who do not fit with the politics of the people who own and operate the newspapers. It has always been a censorous force, never an expansive force, and in a multiracial democracy, which is not what we lived in at the time when this was created and applied, but we live in one now, in a multiracial democracy, I think there are completely legitimate questions about whether or not perhaps we should set the values of our, uh, of our journalism and our institutions with the input of anyone else but explicit white supremacists, which was the newspaper publishers at the time. 
So let me ask oh, uh, anybody. Um, you run a big newsroom. You're, uh, you have a team that's going to be covering this election and the presidential election that comes after it. Um, what do you tell them to do differently? How, how do you lay out um, a coverage plan for them? What kind of freedom do you give them? How do you talk to them in a way that could begin to address some of this? I mean, I think that's a, a really interesting question in light of the way that Masha just framed objectivity as a style, in a sense. Because in a sense, what you're asking is a style question. Take the structure as it is. What do we do stylistically? What do we tell the journalists who are here to do in this situation? And I think, you know, when I think about big picture, long term kind of uh, solutions to these problems of trust and credibility, it can't be in tweaking the system that we have here of what Wesley characterized already as apartheid newsrooms, um, spaces of concentrated power and resources that white people run and make editorial decisions within that are, and this is to a Jay Rosen term of, are, that are seeing diminishing returns in terms of trust and credibility. Like there's less and less trust for those institutions. This idea that we once had, that there was some we that once had trust in the election coverage of American journalism is uh, a very white racialized conception, uh, and an ahistorical conception that doesn't include the lived experiences of many people. And the problem I want to point to there is that we can actually find uh, solutions and new approaches by looking to the people who have worked outside of these systems throughout the history of this country. Um, you know, we've had plenty of grassroots, and I think the example of the gay reporters that covered AIDS in the 80s, you know, grassroots, also very <laughs> underfunded uh, and undersupported efforts to develop trust and, cre trust and credibility within a community. Um, through journalism, through factual journalism. And those examples are there, and they were not big newsroom objective journalists. You know, Ida B. Wells was publishing her work in pamphlets and going around and giving speeches and distributing them. And so to me, the question is not, what is the big newsroom boss going to tell their reporters to do? It's what, of all, what are all of us here going to do to, to create the kind of news economy that we need and that we deserve in order to live in a thriving democracy that we have yet to uh, accomplish or realize. And so it's really thinking outside of that space. I don't think they can do it. I think the diminishing returns in terms of trust and credibility are real. I think those organizations in many ways continue to exist because of a concentration of power, resources, and profits, both not just in terms of news, but in terms of the entire global economy right now. You know, they're serving a really limited set of interests. And so, the, it's, not a, it's not delusional that people don't trust them. People don't see them represented in their pages. People don't see their day-to-day -day lives represented in election coverage. And, pe and people are apathetic, burned out, and angry. And it, rather than sort of saying, well, what can we do to make them trust us? The question I think first has to be, well, why don't they? What is the structural, historical, long-term issue that has led to this? And it's not a secret that racism and racial capitalism uh, and, the, and oppression are creating the dynamic in the first place. Uh, before you say, I promised everybody you'd have question time, which is now. Um, so if you could line up behind the microphone in the middle of the room, um, tell us who you are. Um, and again, please try to keep your question brief so we can um, get to as many folks as we can. Before you, before you do, David, yeah, I mean, I just want to give quickly, uh, there's, there's a lot here I could respond to, but uh, I won't respond to it all, but do, do read my 10,000 word piece at Liberties where I, uh, I do respond. Um, but I do want to give a very different account of what happened to mainstream journalism in the Trump years. I would submit that there was a, a, a pretty widespread uh, abandonment 
uh, of the principles of objectivity, and we saw a great deal more of overt partisan editorializing in places like the New York Times. CNN radically transformed itself from one that, whatever you think of the model, maybe you don't like it, that tried to be a kind of balance, let's hear different sides, to a rah, rah, one side uh, news network. It's now controversially trying to reorient itself again. And, and, and a RAND, there's, there was a very good RAND study that looked at this, the space for opinion, for advocacy in the news pages rapidly expanded in the Trump years. What was the result? An even more precipitous decline in trust. There are a lot of people, black, white, gay, straight, trans, who are looking for sources that they can trust, that don't have a partisan valence. They can also turn to their favorite uh, uh, you know, opinion outlets for those. But for me, if I'm a reader and I want to say, do I want to have the you know, 2024 election covered by only uh, organs of overt opinion and partisanship and advocacy, as great as those traditions are for all the Ida Wells and Ida Tarbells they've produced? Or do I want to also have an important place for the Associated Presses and the Reuters of the world? I'm going to say we need the other. Otherwise, the spaces you open up aren't just for those people say, doing the kinds of journalism and making the kind of arguments you like. It's also the other side. And it becomes, without that anchor, it becomes a war of all against all. And without the objectivity, the basis for determining the truth becomes ever more subjective. So I, I think there's a real danger in kind of wishing for, you know, for all the problems that I readily admit that the objective news institutions have had. Uh, we wish it away, and we get something that's a lot more riotous and ugly. Yes, hi, my name is Roja. I'm a student here at the J School. Um, the New York Times a couple of years ago did like a, a wide survey um, with students, and basically they they were trying to uh, they were looking at um, whether students are able to discern the difference between fake news and truth. And like I, I don't have the exact stats, but overwhelmingly they were not able to. Right. So there's a there's a clear lack of like critical thinking. Um, and as a parent, this is something that, that I think about often, which is like, what is our school system, what is our education system doing or not doing, or what does it have to do for us to change that? And so my question is, um, you know, can you, you know, share your thoughts on, on answering some of those questions? Andy, do you want to start out? That's a hard one. There have been congresses and conferences and, and, and university gatherings and, and, and desperate pleas for help to figure out how to build in a more critical, more evidence-based approach among young people. Um, it's very hard to find things that work. I wish I had an answer. I wish I could say this works. Um, media literacy is often brought out as an idea. This is, this is really important. This is going to work. It's unclear. I've, I've seen very little scholarly literature that shows that it actually does, although what it means is a, is a question as well. You know, how, how do you go about teaching media literacy? It's something we need to keep working on. It, it's something that is, a, a, you know, and, and to raise the question, to raise the issue, to raise the concern is really important. I don't think we're there yet. Hi, my, everyone. My name is Tamia, folks. I'm a part of the full-time MS program. Thank you all so much for being here. I just wanted to ask a question about um, newsrooms and how they should be dealing with journalists, especially those from underrepresented or marginalized communities, reporting stories and often receiving a lot more vitriol and criticism for simply covering the communities that they come from, but not necessarily, um, you know, not being objective, but just you know being of that identity and not feeling protected in their role and you know constantly getting hate and criticism as a consequence of it. What responsibility do you think that news organizations have? in providing protection for that, and, and what do we new, need to do in having conversations on how to resolve that issue? I, I mean, I, from my perspective, the bar is pretty low that we're starting from there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Don't fire them. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like ha have them in your office for a cup of tea. Um, <laughs> that kind of stuff. Uh, but I, I mean, I do think that you're, you're speaking to the question of sort of how what kinds of institutions we build has a 
a really important effect on what kind of journalism we produce because even the organizations that uh, say that they are trying to uh, be more integrated or represent the communities that they serve or, or that kind of thing um, until they are willing to take risks on behalf of people whose lives are routinely put at risk by the systems that we live in, that sort of diversity quota probably won't be met because people, as you're pointing out, um, people of color, black people, indigenous people, trans people, uh, will face risks and consequences that others don't face, even just by being journalists. And so to have us in your newsrooms, you have to stand with us, which is another one of my kind of foundational arguments against objectivity as a, as a stance. Uh, but, I, but I really do think that and that applies to non-journalistic institutions as well. You know, it's just tokenism if you want us to be there so that you look like you met your quota, um, but you don't want to change anything about how the organization operates, how it thinks, what its underlying ideologies are, the culture. So the cup of tea thing is sort of a in tongue in cheek, but also kind of real. <laughs> What do you think, Wesley? I feel like oh, you've I was gonna got say a lot of newsroom experience to go on too here. Too much. The, uh, I, I think that what I was going to note, though, in this, this is what ties back into the conversation we're having, is that powerful white journalists have shown us for a century that they don't believe anyone but themselves can be objective. They did this to, uh, I mean, let's read what the New York Times had to say about Ida B. Wells. It's easy to say now, oh, it's great that we had her. Uh, okay, right? Uh, let's see what uh, the, what, the way it fell to the black press to cover the biggest stories of the of the post-war periods, which were the Great Migration and the um, and the and the horror of lynchings, a thing that the white press couldn't bother itself to open its eyes to. The objective white press, the one run by all the people whose buildings we now sit in. Um, and in fact, assertively, I mean, the New York Times editorialized against Ida B. Wells in the 1890s during the supposed launch mm -hmm. period of their objective era. So we, we, we know the work of the gay press in the 80s and early 90s. We know that we know the work still of the black press around any number of issues uh, that mainstream media couldn't be bothered to deal with until suddenly the streets were on fire. Right. And so. The, but, but again, I think the, the issue, what this boils down to and what this boils back to, right, is we want to pretend that, I think the mistake we make is when we take what is theoretically a process, what is theoretically a set of professionalized standards, and then we begin applying that to individual people, and we say, well, if I can find anything in your personal speech that suggests you uh, possess an opinion, you therefore cannot be an objective journalist. You, can, you cannot behave object, ob objectively. And so when we look at these cases, we almost never see a case of a journalist being punished for failings in their published work. Almost ever. Doesn't happen. That isn't what happened to Emily Wilder at the AP. It wasn't what happened to Alexis Johnson in Pittsburgh. Right? It is always the idea that if the Republicans can prove you're black, well, then you can't have a newspaper job. Right? If the Republicans can prove you're gay, well, then you can't have a newspaper job. Wait, are you a woman who cares about abortion? Well, nope, you can't have a newspaper job, right? That f over and over and over again, the, the, the application of this concept of objectivity at a personal level, that our job is to now run a PR campaign to convince people that we are personally objective, a thing none of us are, right? So if we can effectively lie to our readers, then we get to be a journalist. If we cannot effectively lie, then there's no place for you in the Academy of Journalism. And I think that is why so often when we see journalists from underrepresented, one, it's why one of the reasons that none of these newsrooms can integrate, because they keep running every person who is not them out. But secondarily, it's one of the reasons when we see these things bubble up over and over and over again, right? No, one, no one's been fired for being too buddy-buddy with the cops and drinking with them uh, at the end of the day, right? Which a long tradition of, of uh, white guy police reporters has done, right? But a lot of, but, but meanwhile, Black reporters, since we've ever been allowed in newsrooms, have had to have these tortured conversations. Am I black first or a journalist? No one's going, am I a white guy first? Or am I a graduate of, graduate of the segregation academy first? Or am I the descendant of a plantation owner first? They're not worried about any of those things. And so I think that's one of the failures we have. And I co-sign everything Lewis said, that the bar is so low. All people are asking is for their bosses not to be dicks to them. And unfortunately, <laughs> time and time and time again, the bosses fail that test. Thank you. Um, 
I'm Sonia. I was, I'm a Russian-American journalist. So my question is in particular towards Masha, especially in regards to their reporting on the war in Ukraine um, in the past year. How does, how does the objectivity wars play a role in the weaponization of journalism and the propagandization of journalism in general? I'm just saying, like, I feel like here this discussion is very about domestic journalism in terms of fine tuning, but yeah, I guess, you, does that make sense? I think so, um, and I actually don't think that there's a huge distinction between the conversation about domestic journalism and say the coverage of the war in, in, in Ukraine. Um, <coughs> so um, with, the, uh, with the war in Ukraine, I had to have a conversation with my editors and the fact-checking department uh, uh, at The New Yorker about whether we were going to put in a, dis uh, a, a, put in a clause in the story about war crimes about the Russian government denying those war crimes. The objective style would demand that we give a platform to the Russian government to lie, right? Mm -hmm. um, and in this particular situation, I could effectively make the argument that it contaminated the entire 7,000 or 8,000, whatever it was, word story to have those three lines in it. I know for a fact that if I were writing about something other than the war in Ukraine, or if someone other than me was writing about the war in Ukraine, or if the, you know, if sort of the power um, differential in that particular editing process had been stacked up any differently, I would have lost that battle, right? On any number of topics, um, a story would have been contaminated by an outright lie because the objective style demands it. So that's how it play, they play out. Thank you. I, I would I would just sort of to make a comment. You know, there's a difference between um, a reporter, to, to the last question, having to prove that he or she is objective versus having to be committed to the process or method of objectivity. And there's a difference between a statement from Putin or the Russian government being a lie and a reporter saying this is what the Russian government is telling you, which is a truth. A and, and there are ways, and I respect the choices that Masha makes in uh, the brilliant uh, pieces uh, in, in, in The New Yorker and elsewhere. But <laughs> there are ways that journalists can work within uh, uh, you know, ob objectivity that don't require, I mean, the idea that objectivity requires, as, the, as Eric Severi said in the 50s about the coverage of McCarthy, giving the lie equal weight to the truth, I is actually not correct. That's a debasement, that's a corruption, not a consummation of what the objective method calls for. It's understandable that journalists sometimes get it wrong and sometimes fall victim to that, and they should be rap for when they do it. But uh, objective journalism does not require, <laughs> in fact, it, it properly done uh, goes against uh, compromising the truth. Go ahead. Um, hi, my name is Rachel. Thank you all so much for coming. And I think my question is when I think about objectivity, I link it, I mean, I think about legitimacy and that concept. And so I was wondering, what do you like, because of this conversation, what do you think makes journalism legitimate? Like, how do we uphold it, especially now that journalism is coming under fire? Or, yeah, like, what do you guys think about that? Thank you. Who wants to tackle? I, I think that it's a very useful term. It's one that hasn't sort of been theorized and, um, debated probably as much in the hallowed halls uh, here at the Columbia Journalism School. Um, but there, I think there are many forms, again, of, of journalism that have a legitimacy. Um, it, it might be a, a somewhat more capacious category than objectivity uh, because you can have, um, you know, legitimate journalism that doesn't hew to the um, objective forms. Uh, you know, straight news reporting, New York Times, AP, uh, methods. Um, above all, it has to be truthful. 
I think some form, and objectivity gets kind of redefined as fairness, as even-handedness, some form a uh, uh, sense that the journalist is aspiring to give a full account of the truth um, has to be discernible by the reader. Um, you know, we have journalism that is openly polemical, that sort of makes no pretense about being partisan or one sided or having an axe to grind, and that can be delicious fun. It has real value in our debates, but I think that's not what you're talking about. You're talking about something that we can all uh, put a modicum of trust in, whatever our own personal politics. Anybody else have thoughts on that? I think the crisis of legitimacy that journalism is in is kind of parallel or maybe even the same as the crisis of legitimacy that democracy is in in the US right now. And, and it's really interesting to me to think about this question in terms of process, like what does it look like to actually um, build or rebuild or build a new institutions that have trust and legitimacy in communities. And so I think about that in terms of who do we trust, who do we learn from, we being any, any of you <laughs> and anyone in community. And then what are the kind of ties through public space, through public education, uh, through more than one form of communication, right? Not journalism alone that establish trust and what would it look like to have information sharers and storytellers kind of at that level everywhere who were resourced and some communities still have that. You know, there are communities that have their one little public radio station or their newspaper that everybody reads and then talks about what's in it. That's not gone and there, you know, and there are amazing examples from sort of community presses that are ongoing or that have been around for a long time that have legitimacy that's built kind of from the ground up. And I think in, in a lot of ways that's a, that's a parallel question to sort of the democracy question that's very intertwined as well with how we teach critical thinking and curiosity to, to children and how we practice it in our communities with each other. Uh, my name is Gail Robinson. I'm a freelance journalist. Thank you all for this, this great discussion. I, I wanted to ask a question about in the wake of the Dobbs decision, uh, Rebecca Traister and some others have looked at how we got to this point in time and uh, have s discussed sort of the timidity of the discussion of abortion over the last 50 or 75 years, you know, uh, always portraying abortion as kind of a tragedy, letting the uh, anti-abortion forces wear the mantle right to life and, and you know I'm sure we can all think of other examples so I'm just wondering what all of you think this idea of objectivity played in that debate in getting us to this point where we are now and how the press might address it going forward thank you Well, I agree with you that if we look around the country and we're happy with the media ecosystem and we think the media is doing a good job of upholding the values of democracy, then that's a great victory for objectivity, which has been the status quo for the last century. Wait, hold on. Anybody else? Um, <clears throat> I mean, I, I would actually look at something a little bit different than, uh, than the way <coughs> that the media have covered the uh, abortion wars, which is the abject failure of the media to cover what Donald Trump did to the courts. And I think that, um, that th one of the reasons for that is actually sort of the objective style, right, which is, um, which prevents deeper analysis, uh, prevents wider contextualization, prevents the possibility of, of asking questions about what this portends for the future, um, unless it's a sort of horse racy future of, of, who, of who wins and who loses. And so unless you were an extremely detailed and deep reader of the media, the, um, the packing of the federal judiciary the reshaping of the uh, of of the sort of the, of 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 the uh, of the court system in the United States during the Trump presidency might have blindsided you. You might have actually woken up to it after the Dobbs decision. Well, let, let well, me hold on. Let me let me get to the next question. Oh. Is that good? 
Yeah. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Next, please. Thank you. Hi. Hi. My name is Isaac. I'm a uh, journalist here at the J School, and I have a question about the state of political journalism here in the U.S. in particular. Um, so. Currently, one of the two major parties here in the U.S. is radicalizing against democracy. And uh, Trump and Trumpism has often been described as a kind of aberrant force in American life. But historians and political scientists have for decades pointed to a, uh, a phenomenon known as asymmetric polarization. How can we journalists accurately and fairly capture and explain the political rea realities in the U.S. as they are? without uh, falling to these pitfalls of both sidism and novelty descriptions? Thank you. Terrific question. Well, here, here's the problem with the asymmetric polarization thesis. It was very true during the Bush years. Um, and it's still true to some extent. But left-wing institutions have been racing to mimic right-wing institutions and to catch up and sort of overcome that polarization. Think about the coming into being, think about primary challenges. You know, for years you had right-wing primary challenges to people I think I would have thought of as very conservative United States congressmen who were then defeated by people further to their right. We've started seeing that now happening in the Democratic Party as well. Think about groups like the Justice Democrats and so on. Think about how it used to be for voting for Supreme Court justices uh, you would have you know, a certain number of crossover votes. Now, every single Democrat will vote against every single you know, nominee of, of the Republican to the Supreme Court and vice versa. So, not to say there's symmetry, certainly you're right about the menace that the right poses to democracy and the, the kind of uh, acceptance that's gained uh, in, in the mainstream of the Republican Party. But the danger is that we're starting to see the same thing happening on the left in an effort to catch up, rather than sort of trying to hold down the institutions and norms and rules that would protect democracy. The, the questioner, I think, gets to one of the nubs here, which I think is how do we, well, let me, let me re reframe it as a question. Like, how optimistic are you that um, the political press in this cycle is going to sort of avoid the both sidesism that has that plagued the, the last cycle. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think the both sidesism was the problem in the last cycle. I think the problem was the existence of a, a, a right wing political and journalistic machine that supports Donald Trump. That's sort of quite you know, quite independent of what's happening in the mainstream The both sides, though, refers to his question, which is that you have, there's two parties that are treated equally um, in, their, in, in, how, in, in their approach, and they're not. But they're and not so treated equally. Read the New York Times. They there's are stories often. all the time in the New York Times about election deniers on the ballot in Arizona. I mean, and there are just as many stories about, if there's a proportional number of stories for the Democratic election deniers. There are none. Were they being elected statewide as Democrats, they'd be written about in the New York Times. Right, right. there's not any, so there's, it's not so it's an not equal so treatment, it's equal treatment. It's, but that's for, not if Republicans sides. murder 100 people and Democrats murder zero, there will be 100 more stories about Republicans who murdered people. So that's not there's both not, sides, is that's objective reporting on who's on the ballot. I think, um, I mean, the, pol the polarization framing, I, I've recently come to feel that it's, uh, distraction, that polarization as a concept is usually referring to a different, more specific dynamic, multiple. So it's not like I think it's a, it's one word and it should be another, but sometimes when we're talking about polarization, we're actually talking about um, the consequences of institutional racism uh, finally sort of surfacing because people, because people of color have more access to platforms and white people are angry. Like that's one example of a thing that polarization will be used to describe. Um, another thing I think it describes is class, you know, differences, class gaps, and sort of the concentration of wealth that's happening right now. 
um, globally and in this country and concentration of power. And you know, we are a really, really polarized country in terms of class and education. Um, but often polarization um, referred to as sort of this left-right political dynamic obscures that other uh, very real form of polarization that has material consequences in terms of who consumes the news and how and how much and from where and all that kind of stuff. And so I think that the, I don't expect that the both sides-ism is going to cease in this <laughs> election cycle. I think it's really profitable for news organizations to cover elections as a horse race, as a competition, as a back and forth. Showing both sides has not been proven to undermine confirmation bias. It actually reinforces it. So if you say there's two sides to this story, this one and that one, the people on this side will be like, yeah, my side. And the people on this side will be like, yeah, my side. You actually have to do a story that takes more into account and brings in more nuance in order to not feed into that same confirmation bias. So that's where the objective the quote unquote objective approach to sort of back and forth journalism actually feeds into the same dynamic of polarization and benefits from it. And so I expect that they will keep doing it. Unfortunately, this feels like we're about halfway into this conversation, but the time is up. Um, thank you all. What's that? No, it wasn't a negative note. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you all for being here.